Welcome, everyone, um, back here at the Zero Carbon Future Pavilion. My name is Liebeck. I'm our Senior Director for Europe. It's an honor to welcome you back here. Um, as you know, all this week and last week, we've been investigating the hard questions on energy access, energy security, and climate here at the Zero Carbon Future Pavilion, hosted by the Clean Air Task Force. For those of you who don't know us, we're a global climate organization focusing on overlooked solutions in the US, Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. And it's really my honor to welcome you here today, Commissioner Simpson, the European Union Commissioner for Energy, um, for this very important discussion on the fu future of European energy security, energy trade, and climate. Europe, of course, finds itself in the middle of a global geopolitical and geoeconomic crisis, and there has also been this realization that we'll never be able to go back to the status quo. So I'd love to discuss with you today in this one-on-one, -on -one, what's the vision for European decarbonization and energy security? What is the vision for new energy partnerships, many of which you've, of course, formed here already um, in, in, at COP27? And to the audience, please engage. Please tweet at us with at CleanAirCATF, hashtag Zero Carbon Future. And let's dive right in. So, from, from your perspective, as you're trying to really navigate the crisis, but also um, trying to decarbonize, as the largest importer of energy in the world, how do you see really this diversification of energy imports married with climate in the future? Thank you, and, uh, and indeed, uh, since last autumn uh, in Europe, we have witnessed extraordinary high energy prices. Uh, and that means uh, that we are facing triple challenge um, since war started, uh, since Russia uh, attacked its uh, peaceful neighbor in, uh, in February. And this triple crisis is, of course, climate crisis, but it is accompanied now with uh, very unsustainable and high gas prices that, uh, that have their impact on our electricity market and, uh, and prices for our retail consumers. And, uh, and on top of that, uh, there are lots of concerns about security of supply. Despite this triple challenge, uh, we are committed um, to keep our promises. And uh, this is also uh, now binding for our 27 member states uh, based on climate law that, uh, that uh, we have to become climate neutral by 2050. And for that, we do have long-term strategies in place we call them national energy and climate plans. And based on these national and energy climate plans, we know how we can increase the share of renewables in our energy mix and what we need to do to cut our energy consumption. Because uh, unless we will prioritize energy savings, it will be very difficult uh, to keep our promises. And, uh, and accelerating uh, renewables and cutting our consumption is also, in short term, our answer to current uh, um, supply crisis. As you might know, um, only a year ago, Russia was our biggest natural gas supplier. Uh, their share of our imports uh, was as high as 40%. And, uh, and uh, in our energy market, um, the buyers of natural gas are private companies. So there were lots of uh, long-term contracts signed with Russian Gazprom that Gazprom is not respecting now anymore. But because they don't have alternative supply routes, um, this is now natural gas out of our global market. And that has created also implications to the, to the other regions uh, globally. Our response uh, is um, defined by our Repower EU plan. First of all, where we can, we will save energy. And um, since autumn this year, August of this year, we have been able to cut our gas consumption by 15% compared to the three previous years' um, average consumption. Where we cannot save energy, we prioritize fuel switch. So instead of using fossil fuels, natural gas, we electrify because in the elec electricity market, we have the high share of renewables already in place. And where we cannot electrify and we still need molecules, 
uh, we will diversify our supply um, routes. We do have lots of trusted partners, and so far we have managed to attract um, uh, LNG cargos. Uh, first nine months this year brought us uh, more than 28 billion cubic meters of LNG, more than in previous year. And then, uh, then of course, uh, there are three major gas, natural gas producers um, who are connected with us via pipeline, and they have also increased their production. But uh, we are also um, encouraging our domestic gas producers, the ones who are producing uh, biogas or who are producing hydrogen to scale up, up their production because biomethane helps us also to, um, to clean our energy mix, but also if it's blended into our gas pipelines, then it helps us to face uh, this, uh, this situation of um, of um, a tight gas market situation right now. So, to wrap up, we will keep our promises. We will cut our CO2 emissions. Um, and uh, we will do that by, uh, by um, fastening the green transition, by shortening the permitting for renewables so that even this year and next year, they will help us to get uh, out of this uh, very difficult situation. Yeah, thank you so much. And, you know, I want to touch a little bit on the future, the future vision for European energy, but also we're here at the implementation COP. I think there's been numerous uh, uh, agreements, um, co cooperative, collaborative agreements globally for new technologies. And one of them, for example, is the Mediterranean Green Hydrogen Partnership between Africa, EU, and the Middle East. What, what's your vision for reimagining zero carbon fuels markets or low carbon fuels markets? How do you see this transform and tie into Repower EU? We put forward our own strategy how we will decarbonize our gas market. This is called hydrogen and decarbonized gas market package. And uh, by doing so, we will. Um, we will create a, uh, a demand for green hydrogen, but also we have to well support the producers because uh, now we know that by 2030 we need 20 million tons of green hydrogen and this is impossible to produce uh, these volumes only domestically because the necessary precondition is that you should have enough um, green electricity available. And that means uh, we need partnerships. Just a couple of hours ago, we signed a memorandum of understanding with Egypt because uh, Egypt is one of the countries who is um, willing to use the potential of their solar and wind um, uh, resources. Um, we do have in place um, financing decisions so that, uh, that uh, Egypt can produce more green electricity and and then, of course, we are willing to share our, our knowledge and uh, technology so that, uh, that green hydrogen will be produced here. And if, uh, if um, this is all, all the production is not uh, um, needed domestically, we are offering the market uh, case uh, for this production. And then this is a first uh, in a kind cooperation that we can uh, that we can um, replicate um, in the in the neighborhood, and we are uh, interested um, on that because um, cooperation on clean hydrogen is something that uh, that has perspective for decades to come. Thank you so much, and I I want to stay on the topic of solutions. And you mentioned electricity, the need for twenty four seven clean electricity. Last week, um, you had a wonderful speech on nuclear, and you you said we really need to mobilize all options for di diversification, and nuclear is part of this solution. So we'd love to hear a little bit more on your perspective for the future. This uh, was one of the reasons why I was not able to be here at COP27 last week, because we had uh, 
our annual event of, um, of nuclear industry in Prague. Prague is right now um, holding the um, EU presidency, Czech Republic. And, uh, and indeed, uh, in European Union, um, each and every member state has the sovereign right to decide uh, what kind of energy mix is uh, governing their demand. Um, some of our member states have announced that uh, they will achieve climate neutrality with the help of uh, nuclear energy. Our response as European Commission is to take care that uh, they are respecting the highest standards of safety. We do help them with stress tests. Our responsibility is also to help them with supply so that they are not dependent on only one fuel supplier. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this is also um, a challenge that some member states right now do face because they are dependent on, some of them are still dependent on only Russian nuclear fuel. But, uh, but in the longer run, we need uh, significant investments in the nuclear sector because our nuclear fleet is relatively um, old, it's aging, and to keep the same share in the energy mix demands uh, lots of investments into new reactors. Some of the member states um, have announced uh, their plans and intention to invest into into the new uh, new produc production uh, units and, uh, and um, as European Commission we are also guiding our private investors uh, towards the um, newest and, and, uh, and safest uh, options. And this was one of the reasons why last year we presented the Taxonomy Delegated Act so that uh, only the, um, only the um, investments uh, that, uh, that meet the highest standards will be granted the sustainability, uh, sustainability criteria or public investors can, uh, can, can um, finance uh, freely the, the latest uh, and safest installations. Yeah, and, and let's stay on the future of kind of hard to decarbonize sectors and, and innovation and investment. And a couple of weeks ago, you were in Oslo at the second annual CCUS forum, carbon capture and storage. And you also announced that after the EU has, of course, supported or is supporting multiple projects already via the Innovation Fund, that there will be a strategy on carbon capture and storage. Can you tell us a little bit more about what we're expecting in 2023? And in my speech in Oslo, in, uh, in our um, CCUS forum, I also um, mentioned that this was IPCC board who told that it will be impossible for EU to meet our climate neutrality without carbon capture, because uh, there will be some, uh, some sectors most likely who will still emit some CO2. And uh, we do not have any strategy in place so far, but we already do have six member states who have announced that they will use some of the recovery funds to, uh, to uh, finance carbon capture and storage um, projects. And, uh, and that is a clear signal that, uh, that we need to well develop EU-wide approach so that all the member states um, follow the same rules and, uh, and uh, standards. And uh, we will uh, present um, next year the first uh, document on that based on the working group's um, findings um, that are right now working in the format of uh, CCUS um, uh, forum. So uh, the input comes actually from the, from the sector, from experts, but, uh, but the necessity comes from the fact that uh, there are several uh, member states who are willing to invest 
and will do so. And uh, from, uh, from our perspective, we are also um, ready to invest into the pipelines that help them, them to transport CO2 to the storing sites. And on top of that, with EU funds, we have also um, helped to finance some of the projects um, already. Well, the most uh, known is Longship Project in Norway. Great, thank you. And I also um, want to say a little bit on the, the topic of methane. Um, last year, we, um, it was the Global Methane Pledge was launched, and this year there's significant momentum for, for the audience and everyone who's listening. This is really the most important um, action we can take, reducing methane emissions to shave off half a degree of warming. So there have been multiple announcements and agreements here, including a joint declaration from energy importers and exporters on reducing greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuels. The, earlier this year, um, the EU also announced the we collect, uh, you collect, we buy scheme. So can you tell us a little bit about these strategies and how they will lead to tangible near-term reductions of methane emissions? I do believe that last year the Global Methane Pledge was one of the most significant uh, announcements. And uh, from our side, we have also published uh, our strategy and, and um, and uh, our sector will uh, is committed to well to cut their uh, their methane um, emissions uh, inside EU. But uh, this is not enough globally. We do have uh, lots of super emitters, and we have to tackle all these uh, these challenges. And um, I I do respect highly the work that is done under the UN International Methane Emissions Observatory, because at first you need uh, to identify the um, sites where methane is leaked. From us, from our point of view, it is also important that, uh, that our trading partners um, do their uh, part to cut emissions. And uh, this is one of the reasons uh, why we are offering our, our partners um, support. We call it, um, you collect, we buy um, project. That means that, uh, that economically it is already um, profitable to, um, to invest uh, into technologies uh, that, uh, that help you to avoid venting or flaring and instead collecting methane and, and selling, it, uh, selling it to us. And I hope uh, to make further progress um, with that, with the help of, uh, with the help of financial institutions. Uh, I know that both EPRD and World Bank are interested um, in financing these kind of, uh, these kind of activities. And, and at EU level, we are, we are negotiating our own legislation with our co-legislators. Uh, this is at final stage. And I believe that uh, in the beginning of next year, the legislation is in place um, for our, for our um, energy uh, stakeholders uh, to follow. Great, thank you. And I think we've covered a lot of ground in this conversation on the future of energy, the future of hard to decarbonize sectors, the future of energy security in the European context. Um, so I just have one last question. This is the first of many implementation COPs. So as we're moving from ambition to action between now and COP28, what, do you, what, what do, would you like to see from a global collaborative perspective or within, within the EU to really make tangible progress towards a climate neutral Europe? For us, it is um, essential that, uh, that uh, all the parties who made their commitments will keep their commitments despite the very challenging geopolitical situation. It makes sense to well green your energy sector because um, it is difficult, it is more difficult to manipulate 
uh, these markets where uh, energy consumption is covered by homegrown renewables, it is more difficult to manipulate than to manipulate with uh, this um, fossil fuel um, infrastructure. And, uh, and European Union has kept our promises on financing. We, we prioritize uh, partnerships with, um, with um, partners who are willing to, to benefit from our knowledge and technology and who need this initial um, support being it either uh, financing support or um, clear commitment uh, for future trade, and uh, and this is uh, this is something uh, that this COP also delivers. We, ha we have had a chance to sign several MOUs at the margins of COP, and uh, and I do believe that uh, there will be many to follow. Commissioner Simpson. Thank you so much for joining us here at the Zero Carbon Future Pavilion for this incredible chat on the future of energy security and climate in the European Union. We're excited to welcome you back next year, and we're looking forward to working with you in the meantime. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.